Hey y'all, my name is Marcy Marie. Thanks for checking out my channel. If you like what you see and hear, please like, subscribe, comment, all the good stuff, share everything. <laughs> I appreciate you guys so much. I wanted to talk to y'all today about my experiences in prison in Texas as they relate to sexual harassment. I spent over a decade incarcerated in a Texas prison and I witnessed firsthand and experienced firsthand and then heard so much more um, about sexual harassment. The first thing that comes to my mind when I think of this or like at the beginning of my sentence. So when I first got to the maximum security unit where I was housed, I had been incarcerated at that time in prison for about eight months. I was at the intake unit for eight months and then I hit the main unit. When I hit that main unit, I was housed in a dorm that had cubicle style housing. So if you guys can picture an office cubicle, but the walls are much shorter um, and just lined up, right? Like rows and rows and rows. I think that that dorm housed 152 women. So 152 women lined up in cubicle style housing. That dorm had two shower areas. Each shower had five water spigots or five shower heads for you to be able to shower. And it was an open shower. So we were showering with each other often. You very rarely hit the shower and nobody was in there. That dorm was two story. So along each sidewall, there was upstairs cubicle housing. From upstairs at the very top of the stairs, you could look down and see in the entire shower area. I mean, everybody knew that you could. You might, if you were going upstairs and you were wondering where your bunkie was, like you might glance over there and be like, oh, she's over there. And it's, it was no big deal. The officers that were monitoring our dorms, male and female, could see in our shower area. And that's just what it was. Now, there were some male officers, y'all, that they would um, like walk by with their clipboard, like covering the side of their face. Like they might glance in, make sure everything's okay. Nobody's fighting. Nobody's F-U-C-K-ing because they cared about that more. <laughs> frankly, frankly, the administration in Texas prisons, as far as females go, they care more about us having sex with each other than us fighting with each other. And that's just what it is. Anyways, so they might glance in, but then they're just going to keep on, you know, they're going to make sure everything's secure and keep on. And some wouldn't even glance in y'all. They would put their clipboard up like a blinder. So it was very intentional that they weren't looking in. They made us feel comfortable. And then there were the creeps guys. Y'all know there were some creeps. We had officers that would come on duty and spend the entire shift while the showers were open and standing at the top of these stairs, y'all, and blatantly, aggressively watching a shower. It was completely inappropriate and out of line. So why did we shower at that time? Why? Well, what if we came in from work, from the host squad, from working out in the fields, in the mud, in the dirt, in 100 degree weather covered in sweat? We don't want to sit in that. What if we came in from work in the kitchen <laughs> and we smell like kitchen and we taste like kitchen and we it's horrible. Our skin, you just feel grease on your skin. You want to shower. So I don't know which part is like saddens me more. The fact that these officers were on camera blatantly, blatantly watching us shower, openly watching us and never got in trouble for it. Or if the fact that we became so complacent with it, that we just showered. And it just was part of being there, like it was just part of it, right? That was like my first little taste of, oh, 
Oh yeah, the prison administration does not care about this or they're not doing anything about it. If they care, they're not acting on it. In that same dorm, we had an officer, he worked nights. So the night shift would come in like at 6 p.m. and get off at 6 a.m. Rack up times at 10, bed book count, lights out and you're you're supposed to be staying in your cubicle unless you have to get up to go to the bathroom that would be the only reason you could get out of your cubicle at that time so I'm laying there and it's pretty late uh maybe I don't know 11 30 or something lots of people are already asleep everybody pretty much is laying down with the exception of a few you, you could look over your cubicle wall and see a few people sitting up maybe reading so the prisons even at night there's there's night lights like it's lit where you can see for security reasons it's just never dark anyways i'm laying there and this guy which his wife worked on the unit too yeah, she did. Uh, I knew his wife. We all knew his wife. We all knew him. They were married. Anyway, he stops at my cubicle and starts, and I'm laying down. So <laughs> I'm laying down and I'm in white shorts, like gym shorts, but they're white and I'm in a t-shirt. Um, and yes, I have a sports bra underneath. And yes, I have uh, state issued granny panties underneath. I'm not looking sexy. I'm not trying to look sexy, but I don't know what would make him stop there anyway. Um, and he just starts to tell me how beautiful he thinks I am. So in that position, like it, you have to be, it's tricky to navigate that because you can't just say, uh, listen, guy, go on. You can't do that because they are in a position, those officers are in a position where they have so much power over your life, over your quality of life while you're incarcerated. They have power over whether or not you get to call your kids, whether or not you get to visit your kids. I mean, they have, if they really wanted to go far with it, they have power over your actual freedom. So you have to navigate those waters really carefully. And I just remember that was the first time that a correctional officer had kind of, if I was in the free world, I would say he threw a pass at me, right? So I'm like, oh, thank you. I'm trying to play it off. I'm trying to be kind, but also send the message that I'm not interested in that, right? So I go on with just the huh, thank you. And he proceeds to just stand there and stare at me just stare. It felt like forever. It felt like an extreme amount of time. In actuality, it was probably less than five minutes, but that feeling of powerlessness, you know, it was there. And I could feel him looking at me looking at my body and a creepy weird guy you're married dude move along and you're the law and I don't want to fuck with you kind of way it was horrible it was horrible so I sit up after he walks away and I sit up because now I'm not even comfortable laying down so the way my bed was like here's the cubicle and my bed's here well I sleep with my feet to the door because it's safer than sleeping with your head where if something popped off and your head is closest to the entrance to your cubicle see what I'm saying it's safer so now I'm like man can he see at my shorts like if I lay a certain way it's a summer I'm not sleeping with any covers it's 100 degrees outside and 120 in my dorm you know what I'm saying so now I'm having to think about all this and I'm rotating my body so my head's up here and then I'm like what if your head's close enough to the door and what if he reached in and I'm just picturing like imagining all these things like what if he reached in and touched me or while I was asleep. So as I'm sitting up and kind of working all these scenarios out in my head, I see him and he's stopping at people's cubicles. Like he's making the rounds and he's, I'm sure, doing the same kind of things to these other ladies, like creeping them out. So the next day I'm like, man, I'm, I'm talking to my bunkies about it while they were asleep. While they were asleep, leaving me to, you know, to deal with that. And I'm, and I'm, and they're like, yeah, that's, that's him. That's how he does. And it was just common knowledge.
I hadn't heard it yet. You know, I hadn't heard it yet. Everybody else knew. Imagine if his wife knew, you know, it was just real creepy. So I'll fast forward. There's another creepy guy, but this one, he was young, um, much younger than me. Like I, I think I was probably 39 at the time. And he was in his late twenties. And he was flirty. He was kind of a a good looking young guy. And a lot of the ladies that were incarcerated there would comment that he was good looking or they would maybe even flirt with him just a little bit. Because y'all, when you're when you're incarcerated and you're around, surrounded by women and the, you're used to getting that whatever it is you get when a man compliments you or or however that works and you're used to that and all of a sudden you're stripped of that. There are women that will seek that out in there. So I'm not saying like any prison um, inmate relationship is 100%, uh, you know, from the officers, because sometimes, sometimes incarcerated women will be like in a fragile state and they will seek out that attention or seek out that connection because they're so lonely. It still doesn't make it right for an officer to act on that. It's still illegal. And in my opinion, it's still immoral. But uh, yeah, I have seen women pursue that. So this guy, he ends up being my boss um, in there. And and we have jobs, right? So I have a job and I'm an SSI, which if, if you're familiar with prison lingo, that's a janitor. I was a janitor in the um, administrative segregation housing dorm, which is basically the solitary confinement dorm, the whole. I was a janitor there and he worked in that building and he was my boss and so now as I'm cleaning and doing janitor things, like I'd have to be scrubbing the bottom of the doors because there's a food tray slot there and they feed chow so quickly food would slosh around and run down the door. So I'm like on my knees with a bucket of soapy water um, and I'm scrubbing the old food off of these doors my job. I'm not getting paid. I'm told to do it, right? I'm not volunteering. It's I'm voluntold. And uh he walks by and he makes a comment about my ass. Uh and I was able to just keep cleaning. I'm like ignoring that, right? Like it didn't happen. I don't even have to look up because he's walking. He's not stopped. He's not trying to engage me. But I don't look up. You know, I just keep working. So yeah, that wasn't that wasn't too bad. Like, and I'm even going to admit, even, even if it was just passing and that had been the only thing that ever happened, I, I wouldn't even think that much of it, but it progressed from there. It progressed so severely that in the picket where the guards sit, they, that's where their, chem the chemicals are kept. So they hide them because they think we're going to, I don't know what they're what they think we're going to do with these watered down chemicals, like, I don't know, steal them, sell them. Nobody wants those kind of chemicals. We only wanted bleach. As somebody who was incarcerated, we're buying and selling and trading bleach. We're not like Bippy and whatever we're not, we're not worried about, but they were protecting those chemicals. So you would have to go the picket and you'd have to say, can I get this chemical so that I can mop this area or whatever? He calls me to the picket. And it's over the speaker. So I'm like, he's like SSI to the picket. And that's normal. It means something happened. They want cleaned up or they, they a project's something I got to work, right? So I go to the picket and he <laughs> gets on his knees and completely exposes himself. This kid, like this young guy completely exposes himself. And I'm like, I don't even know how to act because it's the same scenario. Like you can't say what the fuck you can't do that. That's not an option. You, you can't, you have to just kind of play ha ha. Okay. You know, and I kind of laughed ha, ha, and giggled and batted my eyelashes and walked on back and intentionally tried to avoid him. So days later, he's sitting down. So like it's he, the officers have a little table that's in the dorm that they sit at to fill out their paperwork or sort mail for mail call for the inmates that are housed in solitary confinement. So 
he's sitting at this table and he's like, Hey, come here. And I, I'm like, okay, you know, he's sitting there by himself and here I am, you know, and that table is underneath the camera, which means it's a blind spot. Like the camera faces the dorm, the table's underneath the camera. So I'm like, I don't mean, I, I don't, I try not to get close enough. I try to keep my physical body in the camera view, you know, and, uh, Anyway, he didn't touch me or anything like that, but he called me and made me come closer. So now I've stepped in private, but my heart is racing because I know that something can happen right there and it wouldn't be on camera. And my word means nothing, you know, and even if I could report him, like his girlfriend worked there, his friends worked there, there it, prisons are strategically located in small rural towns, which means a lot of the employees are relatives. <laughs> And they become friends, you know, and they, they ride with each other, just like people that are incarcerated ride with each other. They, they're going to ride with each other. So if something happened, if something popped off, I wouldn't be able to safely report that to the staff because yeah, it, even if he didn't directly retaliate, well, his girlfriend or his friends, or, I mean, oftentimes parents, we saw parents and kids and siblings and spouses all working in the same area in the same prison like it's just how it was so um anyways yeah that's that's um like the three that popped out at me the most when um I think about sexual harassment in prison I've heard so many way worse stories from people that I very much trust their word I've seen very much worse things. So anyways, thank y'all for hearing me. Thank y'all for um, letting me share my story. And thank y'all for being a part of it. Please subscribe to my channel for more prison stories from a women's prison in Texas.